And we're back. Our next speaker is Dave Ferguson. Dave's a longtime instructional designer who's worked with both internal and external clients in corporate, government, and not-for-profit settings. He has a special interest in finding ways to organize information so people can apply it on the job and in avoiding unnecessary memorization through tools like job aids. His presentation today will be on analyzing decisions better and faster. Dave, take it away. All right, thank you, Liz. Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to move fast here because it's only a, a limited time frame. I'm very excited to be here talking about analyzing decisions because the nature of the thing is to figure out what the factors are in making some decision so that you can help people make that decision better and faster. And the technique I'm going to talk about is to show you how it's more effective if you start by analyzing the results and move into the factors that are involved in the decisions. I think you'll find there's certain benefits to this. One is you can help those people make better, faster decisions. You can improve your um, exchanges with the subject matter expert because you've got a way of showing what you understand, what you don't understand, what you think might be extraneous or things that you think might be missing because you've got something objective to go by and you can work with your um, subject matter expert to make that happen. There's also some other benefits to there. Complex decisions involve a lot of information and your analysis can end up being a first draft of a job aid because when it comes to information, you've only got two places to store it. One is inside somebody's head and one is outside somebody's head and inside costs a lot more. So you may find, hey, here's a way that I can organize this information. And it turns out my analysis is the first draft of my job aid. So let me share, I'm gonna talk through some slides. Please feel free to ask questions as you go along, but because I'm being time conscious here, we may have to either save them to the end or I'll be around after the session um, at one of the tables in the lounge or whatever that's called. And in the meantime, on this screen, you'll see my uh, email, dave at uh, broadcoveconsulting.ca, not .com, .ca. Um, this will be our lead in into talking about decisions. And we've all had to make a lot of decisions and sometimes we've run into a word wall like this one here. Don't try and analyze it, but it's a little sample set that we're gonna be through, going through here. It's very hard to look at this thing and figure out what am I supposed to do and how do I know when to do it? So let's talk about what makes a decision a decision. Decision always involves at least one choice. We've got a choice here. The choice has to do with what direction do we want to go? And decision always has at least two alternatives. In this case, we could stay on the highway or we can take the exit. That's a pretty simple decision. Here's a more complex decision. And I'm gonna use it to introduce terminology I'll be using here just to clarify what we're talking about. So here I've got a way to, given the opening line to a song and knowing uh, or, or lyric from a song and knowing the artist, I can tell you what, what uh, the song was. So a condition, is one set of possibilities related to the decision. So one of our conditions here is what's the lyric? And the individual lyrics are the states. So in this case, if this were all the data we have, we only have three possible states. The lyric is either gonna be a long time ago or a long, long time ago or long ago and oh, that's all we got. That's one condition. The next condition is who's the artist, and it's got a bunch of different states. And to reach our example, we need to consider both, the, both those conditions to get to the results. Final term we have, and this is one I use a lot, is a set. And a set is one specific combination of states that leads to a specific result. In other words, if or when the lyric is a long, long time ago and the artist is Weird Al, then the song is The Saga Begins. 
when the lyric is a long, long time ago and the artist is Don McLean, the song is American Pie. So the set is one specific combination of states. When we're talking about decisions, some decisions are complex because they've got lots of different states. In this example, we only have one condition, which is what flavor do you want? But most of us have been stuck behind somebody in a um, ice cream bottle or something, and they can't make up their mind because there are too many states for them to choose from. But in the real world, complexity tends to come from multiple states. Uh, I'm sorry, multiple conditions. So this is a chart I made up based on information on the uh, Citizenship Canada website. Um, am I a Canadian citizen is what the website says. And it turns out just in this little summary thing, there's five different conditions that may apply. But you can see in most of the cases, not all five do apply. So that's what makes it complex. And that's what makes it hard to figure out. Okay, so we're going to go back to that uh, word wall that we saw afterward, and we're going to use this as the tool. Um, you don't have to memorize this stuff because we're going to talk about it as we go along, but how do we proceed through this? And here's how. Step one, just pick one result from the decision. So in the sample here, I've got that same language. I just went through it and I found one result, which is under certain conditions, I can offer the VIP discount. And I've hi highlighted it twice here, which tells me that there's at least two ways that I can get to that decision. Step two, just find one set that leads to that result. So I go back into the word wall and I say, what's one way that I can get the VIP discount? And it turns out I can get the VIP discount if I'm a current customer and my credit code is one. I need both of those in there to get to VIP discount. Anybody, hey, is this clear so far? I don't want to race along too far. I just want to make sure that we're, uh, we've are we got the time that we need. I'm going to take that as a yes. Okay. Step three, this sounds pretty simple. Find other sets for that same result. Instead of just cherry picking all over. Okay, are there any other ways that I can get a VIP discount? And it turns out there is another way. You can get a VIP discount if the price of the thing they're buying is more than $999. Notice this one doesn't say anything about what kind of customer they are. We let anybody have the VIP discount if they're spending that kind of money. So we have two different sets that get people to the result. You'll be really surprised by the next step, which is just keep repeating this for the other results. Choose a result, find the sets one at a time, and continue for all the results. Now, this one here looks kind of messy, but that's if you see logical categories as you're going along, you might put them under one another, but you don't have to. You'll have to clean it up later on. You can do this in a spreadsheet like I did. You can do it on a whiteboard. You can do it with post-it notes, which is a real good way because you move them around. But if you took this chart, went back to that word wall, you would see that I have captured all of the possible sets for all the results which were here, which were only two. You either get a VIP discount or you get a courtesy discount, but it turns out there's five combinations of ways to get there. There's five sets for those results. Okay, next thing you do is let's reorganize that now. I usually start with the results in the left-hand column because that's where I'm beginning. And I say, what, take, what does it take to get there? When I've got them all, I move it over to the right. And so now, I can move the results to the right and I sort all the data by that result column. That way all of my courtesy discounts will be together, all my VIP discounts will be together. If I had a platinum discount, they'd all be together and it helps me see the factors leading into those results. 
So then it's easier for me to take the states and group them into columns. And you'll notice we ended up with four columns. These are pretty obvious. Sometimes it's not so obvious and you have to wrestle with them, but I've got a kind of customer column. I've got a kind of credit code column. I've got a price column and I've got an item code column. At this stage, it doesn't matter which one's where because I'm still gonna reorganize them, but now it's a lot clearer what applies. Step six, let's rearrange that in a more useful order. And what I call it is let's find the best first condition. There's no one right answer to this, but I'm gonna move one of the conditions all the way over to the left. And in this example, it was customer, which is already on the left. I could have moved price or something else. It doesn't matter in a sense, but you've got to use your judgment. What's the best entry into this data? Is it something that's geographic? Is it something related to part number? And I took the second condition. Once I know the customer, what's a good one for me? Oh, credit code's good. I'll move that into the second column. And then I sort first by the kind of customer and then by the kind of credit code. And you can see this data is already getting easier to work with. Next step is stop <laughs> and ask yourself, Am I missing anything so far? Now that the data is starting to take shape, are there results I haven't considered? Are there states I haven't considered or conditions? For instance, notice down here, I didn't really have a customer called anyone, but I've got a uh, combination of, con of conditions here that applies to anybody, whether they're a current customer or not. So anybody who's paying $500 or more is gonna be entitled to some kind of discount, depending on how much they're paying. So that was a way for me to uncover that and think about how I want to label it. In addition, the original chart, the original word wall didn't say this, but it's pretty obvious from the data that if you don't qualify for any of the discounts, you should be paying full price. And if I'm creating a job aid for the people in my uh, store that sells spare parts for teleporter machines, um, I may want to put this in here so that they don't goof up and they're clear that this is what you do. Okay, step eight, clean up and clarify. All I've done here is to A, add some labels up at the top that are the beginning of the conditions. B, within any given condition, I had repetitions before. Remember every line said current customer. I just collapsed that into a single one. And I did the same thing for the any one uh, sets. Just made it cleaner. Second level cleaning. I just eliminated some of the boxes that don't do anything. Now, this has been a kind of very fast through this and a very simple data set. So I didn't want to leave you feeling like, wow, I didn't get to do anything. Here's a more complicated set of data. It's actually based on a real um, client project I worked on. This was their reference guide. I've transformed it into a uh, traded allowance for your old hyperspace teleporter. We want to sell the new ones, so we're going to give you a trade-in. This is not an easy chart to work with, but if you'd like to try applying these techniques, I've got a PDF I've created that lets you walk through the eight steps and gives you examples of what you should have at each one so you can see how you could get from this chart to this chart, which I think you'll find would help people make the proper trade-in decision better and faster, which was the point of this whole exercise. <sighs> and that's that. So any uh, questions or comments? Liz, you're right on time. <laughs> Technically, you still have five minutes in case anybody does have any questions. 
Okay, I do have one. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you about one example, and um, I can uh, throw the like at my blog. I had replaced a faucet in my kitchen, and I didn't know the model number. All I knew that it was a Moen faucet. So I went to the Moen website, and it turns out that Moen has almost seventeen, almost 19,000 different faucets. You guys now know those are all possible sets, right? Do you know how many conditions they walk through? Seven. It's a wonderful thing. The first condition, uh, the first condition, they've put, they pose it in a question on their website. And the first condition is, um, what room are we in? Because if you've got a kitchen faucet, you're not interested in a bathtub faucet. You're not interested in a laundry faucet, so on and so forth. They've got a condition like, how many handles are there on your faucet? Do you have a one-handled faucet or a two-handled faucet? And each one of those things slices through so that as I went through, I was able to answer seven questions and I got from 1,868 faucets down to 31. It's an example of how you can slice through that data and uh, hide things from people or not hide things from people, but create a process where it's vastly easier for them to make the proper decision with a whole ton of information. Anyway, I will be around um, uh, in the um, lounge or whatever it's called. If you want to talk about this farther on, later on, and if not, uh, drop me a line, Dave at Broadcove Consulting. It's all one word, dot C-A, because I'm in Canada. Thank you so much, Dave. So once the session is over, um, after Clark finishes, they will be in, in, um, in the lounge in table one. So you can ask him more questions there. And someone's asking if you're going to send that PDF. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, I had the PDF. Hang on a second there. Where did I put that link? I just put it up about five minutes before the uh, session went on. So if you have trouble with that, let me know. Awesome. So it's in the chat if anybody wants to open it. And I'll also just give a little tiny plug for Dave's in Sampler, which is a blog where I discuss uh, job aids and other kinds of support. And I have a lot of examples. I'm very happy to have been here and uh, hope to hear from you later on. Thank you so much, Dave. All right. So next up, next up we have Clark Quinn. And his presentation is going to be on diagramming for cogitation and communication. Clark, take it away. No worries. Good day, folks, and thanks for being here. Uh, welcome to see you. It's an honor to follow Dave. He's a not only a colleague, but a friend, and uh, uh, great stuff that you heard. Uh, Mike's talk is going to take a slightly different approach, uh, not maybe as quite as practical, but a uh, bit more conceptual background that goes with it. Um, no worries. Let me figure out now how to start uh, my presentation. I've practiced this, so we should be getting it good here. And there we go. So to start, I like to have an example. And to me, it's quite interesting how two words and three lines can communicate an idea. A fun one, <laughs> a silly one, but I think that's the core of what the value is we're talking about here is how to communicate elegantly in ways that tap into, that are visual instead of textual in the large sense. So I'm talking about diagramming for cogitation and communication. I'm Clark Quinn of Quinnovation and the Learning and Development Accelerator. And I'm going to give you a little bit of my background just so you understand the strange and twisted way I look at the world and can interpret my statements in that perspective. I saw the connection between computers and learning as an undergraduate, designed my own major, it's been my career ever since. It's been taking strange twists and turns. I've, uh, my first job out of college was designing and programming educational computer games. I realized we didn't know enough. I went back to get a PhD in what was effectively applied cognitive science. From there, I did a postdoc, was an academic for a while, joined a couple 
uh, startups uh, in new media and learning. And uh, eventually the past couple decades plus I've been a consultant to organizations, but that focus, and it's led to lots of things, games, mobile, strategy, learning science, but at core it's been about taking what we know about how we think, work and learn and using that as a basis to develop solutions, whether there's technology or policies and practices and processes that work in ways that are most optimal. I'm going to encourage you as a part of the practice to mind map the talk as I'm giving it. A mind map in a sense is a diagram. This is a mind map of mind mapping. And you see the arrow behind it shows the flow. If you do, by the way, um, please share it. But uh, I just uh, can't not suggest practicing what we preach. And we'll make the rationale for doing this clear as we go along. So why do we use diagrams? What is it about diagrams? I like as a framework, Harold Yarkey has his personal knowledge mastery. And to me, it's a mechanism for managing the information overload and flow. And it has three major steps that I find useful for thinking and talking about this. The first one is seeking information. Now that can be actively searching, but it can also be setting up feeds so that you're getting information from people you think are interesting, like Dave Ferguson's and Sampler. There's something to track and you wanna have trusted people presenting their latest thoughts so you can track that. Then you make sense of this information. This can be experimenting, trying it out, applying it. It can also be writing it up or other ways of making sense of it. And then you share your learnings outwards with others, both to help educate them with what you're thinking, but also for them to parse and give you feedback and help improve your own learning. And that starts the cycle again. Now for me, diagrams play a role in two senses. I make sense of things I'm trying to understand by diagramming them, by placing those elements and relationships and playing with them until I feel like I've got an understanding of how things work, and then I share them. So really what we're talking about is diagrams are ways to gotchitate and communicate. So for instance, I started playing with what is the design depth and what is the technical elegance of some of the typical solutions we have? This was a long time ago, many years ago now, but I was placing things on this diagram and I iterated through it in several instantiations that ultimately became this framework, which I used to think about the performance ecosystem, which is an element in my mind of the revolution learning and development needs to have, which is one of the uh, campaigns I have continued to promote is looking, I have a cheeky statement that L&D isn't doing near what it could and should and what it is doing, it's doing badly. Other than that, it's fine. <laughs> this is a way to try and capture that and address it, provide useful frameworks to think about moving forward. So we use not just to cogitate and to help sh shape our thinking, but to communicate. This diagram was one that Edward Tufta talks about, you know, basically centerpieces in his work on communicating. This is a diagram of Napoleon's march to Moscow to try and take over Russia. And it, it's labeled spatially in that you see the various locations that they pass, but the width of the line indicates the amount of people in the army. And you can see it dissipated at various battles along the way. And on the way back, it really took some substantial hits. So the line gets very thin. And at the bottom, you can also see how the temperature rose and fell and it that influence of the freezing cold um, on its implement. And it's a very powerful communication tool and uh, thus its role is very useful. Another famous diagram is situated leadership, which is conceptual now. They're, you know, the locations mean something, but not physical. They don't map to physical locations. Instead, they're communicating relationships, in this case, about how people develop over time and how your uh, coaching strategy should work along with that. Another type is a graph, where in this case, it's the limits to growth. That was a famous uh, paper published, and I, interestingly, and it talks about how we're precipitating crisis if we don't change the ways we're doing. And interestingly, I heard them, one of the authors speak 
a number of years ago and people were saying, how come, you know, we haven't received, seen these drastic outcomes you were predicting, said, no, we're on track. They're still to come. And if you see um, right about now, some of these are beginning to become the problems they were talking about. So one of the ways to think about it to me is the communication roles of media. When you need to communicate context, you, what it really looks like in the situation, a photo, or if it's dynamic, a video communicates it. If you're conveying essentially linguistic conceptual information, a text or audio can communicate it. But if you're conveying concepts, a graphic can represent the underlying conceptual relationships or in a dynamic state animation. And that's where diagrams play a role. They can help communicate conceptual information because of those relationships. Now, as an aside, I wanna talk about the importance of models. And this is when information in the head can be really useful. Those two diagrams come from an experiment that David Kiris and Susan Bover did. And they gave the, the top diagram to a group of people. It really was a control panel and they trained people to flip the switch and wait for the lights to come on and move the, le the, the selector and then press a button and light this other button. And they trained them and people got, were learned it quite quickly and quite accurately. A second group had essentially the same control panel but they were given a story about it. It was the power for the Starship Enterprise, the phaser banks, and so you, tapped into the ship's power by flipping the switch and waited for the lights to light, indicating the accumulators were full. And then you selected a particular phaser bank and pressed the button to fire that bank and you fired them. Now this group didn't learn quite as fast and didn't perform quite as accurately. They learned fast and accurately, but not quite as much. However, then the interesting part of the experiment was they broke one of the main channels to accomplish this task. You couldn't use the main accumulator. Now the first group, was essentially totally stuck. They couldn't do anything. The second group, because they had the model, could infer what an, a secondary approach would be and were able to still successfully fire the phasers. The point here is that having a basis for explanation and prediction gives us tools to deal with ambiguous situations when things go wrong or to even to fill in missing steps that we've forgotten, but we have a model that allows us to reconstruct it. So these conceptual models based on conceptual elements and relationships give us a basis for making decisions. And that's what diagrams do for us is they communicate models when we do them properly. So how do diagrams work? They map conceptual relationships to spatial relationships using a robust visual processing system to support comprehension. Now, Jill Larkin and Herb Simon wrote a what two top cognitive scientists from Carnegie Mellon wrote a wonderful article called Why a Diagram is Worth 10,000 Words, sometimes. Um, and, but that's effectively it. They really pointed out that what happens is you have information at locations and related information is in adjacent locations. So you can quickly find what next and it minimizes the amount of computation you have to do. In this case, it's a diagram about how to create meaningful practice um, and you need a contextual setting and then you need to precipitate a decision like the type that Dave was talking about. And then there are correct answers and incorrect answers and there's consequences of those. But the point is this makes it easy to understand what order things come in and what happens as outcomes. It supports the processing that otherwise you might have to have a complicated text. Technically, people tend to talk about three types. The first one is spatial, where you're mapping real spatial relationships to a representation of spatial relationships so that you can make an understanding of a more complex situation simpler. There's conceptual diagrams, which is largely what I'm talking about here, where things aren't necessarily physically there, but conceptually, these are the elements and this is how they play out and this is how they relate. And of course, then there are graphs and charts that show how things change across various other variables. Spatial, again, is just physical layouts. This is showing how components are uh, put together to create a particular complex device, but where different elements are located. 
A conceptual diagram from the Wikipedia definition, we take a collection of items and relationships between them, express them by giving the items a 2D position while the relationships are expressed as connections between the items. So for example, this is diagram I use to communicate the relationship between how you implement a simulation and its fundamental underlying structure. And the details don't matter. The point is that there's the elements and there's the relationships and the spatial arrangement communicates information as well. And then there are graphs and charts back to Wikipedia. Display a relationship between two variables that take either discrete or continuous range of values. This is a diagram I use to communicate the relative value of formal and informal learning methods as you transition from levels of expertise from novice to, practi to through practitioner to expert. What we're doing is using external representation to support some basic cognitive needs, computational offloading, taking benefits of re-representation to support uh, making decisions, and use it graphic constraining to similarly uh, communicate information. So computational offloading. In this instance, I'm talking about, here's some text, I'll let you read it, but it's communicating some certain relationships. Subjects would rate analogies from best to worst. It's a little similar to analogy, mere appearance of false analogy. Their recall from best to worst was already similar to mere appearance of true analogy and false analogy. This actually comes from Don Norman's book. What he was kind enough not to mention is actually comes from my PhD thesis. And what he pointed out was, this is really hard to parse. Why don't you use a diagram? And in fact, a diagram helps make clear that in those two lists, the switch that happens between those two middle elements is what's critical. So we're offloading the computational processing from trying to make a mental map from that complex prose to a simple diagrammatic representation. Another instance in creating a complex content model for a, a client, trying to verbally discriminate between all the different delineations and elements would have been difficult. By creating a diagram, I was actually able to, to show the structure and the flow uh, from the learner experience and how the elements build on top of that. And it made by quick reference an easy way to see all the elements and the relationships rather than trying to have to parse it through prose. Re-representation. Uh, my PhD advisor, Don Norman, again, uh, in one of his book, Things That Make Us Smart, talked about how he was trying to map a flight from San Diego to London. And he had this information and he wanted to make some decisions about which was the best flight to take. When he re-represented it, he then could, and mapped it to important criteria like time of day and gate, you know, and changes in duration of stops, you could make a much better decision about which flight would be most comfortable in terms of, do you prefer, you know, are you a bad sleeper? In which case you might prefer to uh, leave, uh, get, to London early in the morning so you stay awake all day so you'll have a better chance of sleeping at night. That's my situation versus if you're a good sleeper on plane, you might wanna take the one that gets you there um, able to start working right away type of thing. So it's that sort of decision that re-representing in graphics provides capability. And similarly, graphic constraints taking that same situation, one of the things you might wanna also be interested in is which flight's actually longer. This doesn't help, but if you rearrange it, suddenly it makes it easier to decide which flight uh, has the longest duration. And if that's something you aren't really thrilled about spending time in a steel tube, you might want use that information to make a decision. I'll note that diagrams can convey more information than just the elements and the relationships between them. By additional coding, we can do use different fonts to communicate information. We can use different shapes to communicate information. We can use different colors to communicate information. We can use different patterns to communicate information. We can even use different size to communicate relative information. So we have more channels than just the elements and the relationships. So I do wanna talk about designing a diagram. First of all, you need to identify what goal is this diagram trying to achieve and then what model 
is going to be an element in this. Which model uh, are you using to communicate? Because many, oftentimes different things, there's different ways of parsing it, which leads you to different models. And in fact, representing different models can be a powerful communication tool to help people comprehend something. But any one diagram can only choose one. Then you're gonna choose the components. And that includes the elements you want to include, the relationships between them that you feel are important to represent, and any additional dimensions. So you have to choose what parts of that model are going to go in. Then you need to choose how you're going to represent them. What are you going to use for the elements? What are you going to use for the relationships? And what are you going to use for the dimension coding? And finally, you're going to place these elements. You've chosen them. And now you want to place them, you're going to add the relationships, and you're going to layer the additional dimensions. Now realize, if you build it, you're not done, you're going to need to tune it. In fact, this is my cogitation practice, is taking the elements, deciding what to include, putting things in, deciding I need to add something else, moving it around, realizing that doesn't communicate it well, I haven't used the hierarchical structure of space as a way to communicate relative relationships, whatever it is, you tune it. And then you might still want to add some graphic design. So the fact that, you know, if you aren't a graphic designer, getting the relationships right and the everything else right is fine, but then you still might want to improve it through some uh, graphic design. So in fact, I can represent this as a diagram. So identify the elements, choose the model, then pick the things, then choose the representation, then place them and manipulate it and tune. Note that tuning is nine tenths of the effort. Will Wright was talking about game design. That may be a bit of elaboration for diagrams, but I find that that's not a bad estimate. And finally, when it comes to the graphic design, I love this quote. Designer knows he has achieved perfection, not when there's nothing left to add but when there's nothing left to take away. So map conceptual relationships to spatial relationships using our robust visual processing system to support comprehension. Use models, design diagrams, and thereby accelerate learning and performance. I wanna say thanks. Uh, lots of ways uh, to reach me and ideas that end up in presentations like this and in books tend to show up on my blog first. If you need help sleep at night, great place to go, learnless.com. I'm on Twitter if you have that affliction, places to find out about books and things and more. At this point, I'm gonna stop the presentation because I haven't been able to see the chat when I've been doing it this way. And I um, now want to open it up to the floor for the amount of time we have questions before we get tossed out and sent to various tables in the room. So I'll escape. And I will stop sharing. And I will say what's well, been having. Um, I don't, um, any questions? I can't see the emoji. She has it too small on my screen. Um, but uh, hey, Meg. Nice to see you. Um, oh, I'm Joe Gansey. Cool. It's my head exploding. <laughs> I realize I tried to cram a lot in there, but um, 20 minutes, and I really like to make sure that uh, um, you uh, get some, you know, understand the principles behind diagramming, besides also some practice to get in chess and playing it. So, um, Liz, I realize I'm close to the end of my 20 minutes. I'm gonna have you drop in and uh, give us our next directions. Do you have steps documented on your blog? That's a good question. And um, to be honest, I don't know, but I, if not, I will make a post <laughs> that has the steps. Um, Thank you so much, Clark. Um, so Clark and, and uh, Dave will both be available in the lounge uh, after this presentation is ended, after I end the session. So, uh, Clark, I would ask you to go to table two, and Dave can go to table one. So, please, everyone, f feel free to continue the conversation there. Sure. And I will tell Meg, I'm pretty sure that diagram about how to make a diagram is on my blog. So, um, do, just do go to my blog and search for diagramming in the search box, and you should should be one of the hits that comes up. 
Um, okay, I have to figure out how to go out of here and back to the room. Okay, um, yeah, I'll, I'll end the session and then I'll direct you. Um, how to okay, no worries. I'm going to table two. Yep. Thank you, everyone.